Our speaker tonight, a guy called David Drew, right here beside me. I know David well from over the years. Um, when I was doing research here 20 years ago in the Burren, David was one of the guys whose papers I consulted an awful lot. Um, he published a lot of papers, scientific papers over the years about the Burren. And he lives in Carron at the moment, so he knows the Burren both as a researcher and as somebody who's living here. He was senior lecturer, lecturer in physical geography at Trinity College between 1972 and 2011 which is almost 40 years, it sounds like a lot. Um, he's published numerous articles, as, as I just mentioned, and um, he's contributed to the Atlas of the Irish Rural Landscape, and we had Kevin Whelan, as I said, here last month. Um, he's recently published a book called The Karst of Ireland, which we'll mention a little bit later, which is available not here tonight, but through the Geological Survey of Ireland. Uh, you have to order it online or, or by post. And he's also contributing to an upcoming book on the caves of Western Ireland, as far as I know. So. Um, David himself is a keen caver and uh, he's a great friend and supporter of the Burnaby Trust. He's sat through countless uh, <laughs> boring meetings as recently as this week. Uh, so we're greatly appreciative of that and of, of his um, willingness to speak here tonight. So over to you, David, and a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a good few of you who are here tonight were, were here for Kevin Whelan's talk last month and if you want more of the same you're going to be bitterly disappointed because <laughs> Kevin's was a very wide-ranging talk. He talked about the borough and sure but the rest of Ireland and wider and it was people focused and archaeology focused all of which made for very interesting talks. Now this time it's going to be totally different. What I'm going to try and do is deal with two neglected topics or subject. One is the, the non burren burren, and the word burren has been used dozens of times already this evening, but my burren is going to be the different one, the bit that we're in at the moment, and not the glamorous one down the road there. So that's the topic. It's not about people. It's by and large about things, about the natural landscape rather than the human, which is another tough one to put over. And thirdly, it's about hydrogeology, which is my subject, which means the study of underground water which again is extremely difficult to make sexy. And so what we do is, is try with a, a title to make it faintly intriguing. So what I want to do is the, the neglected burren. And we're on it at, at the moment. It's not recognized as part of the burren by tourists or by Forty Island, but it, but it is a part of it. And it doesn't have the, the glamour of the noble borough. Now, you, I guess you've all been to the eastern hills of the borough at some time or other. This is Mullet Moor, or the view from Mullet Moor, but anywhere on the eastern flank of the upland borough, as far as Schlieve Carron <coughs> in the north, would give you the same view. If you look west, that's what you see, and that's the popular idea of what the Burren's about. Hills and bare, craggy rock, not much water, the odd spring, lots of archaeological features, and the rest of it. And that's, that's, that is the, the marketed Burren, but it's not the whole Burren by any means. It's 50% bigger at least than that. And that's the part I want to talk about. So if you go to one of those eastern hills and turn round, and look the other way, and look east, that's what you see. Almost the same view anywhere you are. And you're looking across, in that case, to Schlieve Orty on the far side, Schlieve Burner, further down, and you are, give or take, where that yellowy dot is there. That's the top. So that was the other thing about this talk. I want to make it tubber-centric. <laughs> tubber tonight is the centre of the universe. And it is. It's absolute dead centre of the area I want to talk about tonight, which is to the north, to the left, on that side. talk about is to the left of, of our yellow dot there, 
to Kinvara, around about 20 kilometres or thereabouts, and to the right down to Ennis, around about the same distance. So Tubba is right in the middle of, of this area. And we're part of a, a far bigger area. The map on the left is, is a geological map, but don't worry about that. It's the blue bits that matter, and the blue bits are limestone, and the other non blue bits are some other rocks that don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but this part of Ireland obviously is overwhelmingly limestone, and it's also lowland. Most of that area you can see is below 300 metres, and a good part of it is below 50 metres. And it's a very big, extensive area. So the southern limit is the Shannon estuary, and on the east, the River Shannon itself, and to the north, the uplands of Sligo and Leitrim, going Bourbon and the rest of it, and to the west, the mountains, which are not made of limestone all the way up. All the rest is one enormous lowland, and under it is limestone rock. And limestone rock, as you go to hear ad nauseum this evening, is peculiar. It does strange things, especially to, to water. A big area, around about 9,000 square kilometres, so a, a considerable percentage of the whole of Ireland. Tonight, I just want to talk about that little bottom left-hand corner of it, which is blown up there on the right-hand map. And I've called it the Kinvara Gort Ennis Lowland, but it's a, a sort of corridor, because on either side of it are uplands. On the left, the Burren, and on the right, the Schlieve Orty and Schlieve Werner Mountains. So it's a, a corridor of limestone linking Galway Bay with the Shannon Estuary. And on either side of it, it's surrounded by non-limestone rocks in part, and that's, that's what makes it peculiar. And that's, that's the way to see it, or rather not see it, the, the M18 stroke M17. <coughs> Ennis to Chum runs right down the middle of this area, and you can drive along that see absolutely nothing except green fields on either side and bungalows in very large numbers. <laughs> and even if you got out of the car and walked, you still probably wouldn't see anything very interesting because what's there is, is hidden to some degree. You need to search for it, look for it in the way you don't on the main burrow. And this is why it's not a tourist attraction because the, the, the interesting things are far from being obvious. But if you drive that, you will drive right by many of the features I'm going to describe this evening. We'll go over one or two of the features on the motorway. Indeed, the big caves run under it in part. So really what I want to do, I'll be happy if at the end of this, you said, I want to drive that motorway again, but this time see some of the things on either side of it. And what I'm doing tonight is second best big time, what it should be going on is a field ship to go and look at them in the field. So this is very much to excite curiosity and maybe you're going to have a look. There's the geology and take little notice of that except to say there's three sorts of rock on it. The whatever that colour is on the left, sort of browny fawn is it? My colour vision is terrible. And on the right, on the left are rocks that are lying on top of the limestone and on the left on the right are rocks that are older and are poking through from beneath the limestone. Either way, they behave very differently to the limestone itself. Now, how to put a framework on this tour? <coughs> I've decided to do it by doing two rivers, one of which exists and the other one half exists, and is an invention of, of mine almost. And to take you on a sort of guided tour down both those rivers and say, aren't they strange? Aren't they different to ordinary rivers? And the two, the River Fergus, which I guess you know, and the Gort River, which you've probably seen in Gort, and that's about it. Two rivers that drain all this area, and yet they are pretty secret rivers. You don't very often see them. The Fergus, yes, there's about three bridges on main roads, and obviously in Ennis you see it, but then it, it disappears again. <coughs> The Gort River, even stranger, the only place most people would ever see that probably is in Gort itself at the bridge. And the river comes from nowhere and it goes from nowhere. To follow these rivers is really, really difficult. 
hard terrain to go through, it's fair to say. It's a sort of secret, even though everybody should know the names. Now, what I want to say is, limestone does funny things to rivers and water. Because, as you probably know, it, it dissolves the limestone rock. And that means it opens up tunnels in the rock, and eventually the river goes underground. And it's a characteristic of all these limestone areas, karst areas, as they're called, so the, the water goes underground. And on the burrow, it does the same. There's lots and lots of rivers going underground. Again, most tourists never see them because they're a bit off the beaten track. Lots of springs where the water comes back up, but again, none of them are very, very obvious. But let's start with normality. The Aina River at the Hinch, goes to the sea at the Hinch, the waterfalls down to Steinman. The main river goes down to Aina, down the N85, and it's got tributaries going to the north. And it's Lickeen Lake is there. Whoops, what had to happen? Lickeen Lake, where it starts, is there, south of Kilfenora. Now, that is a, a god fearing river. It behaves itself. What you can see there is all there is to see. Rivers flowing on the surface, small tree streams joining together to form a big river, and the river decently goes to the sea in Ennis. Why is it a normal river? Because it's not on limestone. It's all on the rocks that form the cliffs of Moa, give or take. Right? And that sort of rock doesn't let water go underground. The water has to stay on the surface, form drainage channels, which is what rivers are, and into the sea it goes. So bear in mind that's, that's a, a river doing the decent thing and, and staying on the surface, and what you see is what you get. <coughs> but not with these characters. So we'll start with the Fergus. Now, that's... that's there's going to be lots and lots of names <coughs> in this, and I hope you, you know some of them. Most people are local enough to have been or know names. But to give you an idea, that's roughly what the Fergus drainage system looks like. I haven't put in all the stuff over to the east, and I haven't put in all the tributaries. But the basics of it are there. So, <coughs> we are off the map up there somewhere. But the river starts over here south of Kilfenora, which is up there. There's a funny bit there that's missing, we'll come back to it later. It flows along, it goes through a series of lakes, Inchy Quinn, there, then Corofin, then Atador, then Teo, <coughs> then all the way down to Loch Dremor, down there, and then Baliala, Alia, <coughs> outside there. So it's a normal river, like that, big tributaries up in that direction, goes through lots of lakes en route, so that's what it looks like as of now, but not, not the way it was in the past. And there's, there's two things I want to sort of run in parallel. This river, especially, but also the Gort River, have changed through time. And I mean two sorts of time. Geological time, hundreds of thousands or millions of years, and on the human time scale of the last one, two hundred years, where humans have been messing with drainage. So the rivers have changed. They're not immortal at all. And that's true of our, all Irish rivers, effectively. So, we go back to some specified time between 15,000 and 2 million years ago, because I haven't a clue <laughs> when, but sometime in the past, that was the upper regions of the, the River Fergus, I think. And hard to prove wrong. So what that was was the very topmost bit of the previous slide. Okay, the very top bit just around Kilnaboy. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Top around there. <coughs> That's all there was of the River Fergus there. Why? Because I think it used to disappear in what is now Lake Inchiquin. And from there it went underground. I don't know where, I, don't, I can't imagine anybody will ever find out. But it seems as though the river course, yes, there was a, that nice valley, then it turns south and it goes into Inchy Quinn. And it then disappears. And you can see 
what's happening at the bottom there is a bathymetric map of Loch Inchy Queen, contours of the depth effectively. And as you can see, the whole lake really is one big hollow because what those contours are saying is a great big in basin and it's deep. It's 30 metres deep, something like that. And at the bottom of it, a couple of years ago, NUIG did a, a, a coring at the very lowest point of that because they wanted to see what the sediments were like. They were just interested in the recent sediments, the last 12,000, 14,000 years. But at the bottom of it, they hit a clay, a grey clay, and that everywhere in Ireland, that means the end of the last ice age, stuff that was laid down about 15,000 years ago. They stopped then because they were only interested in material that had pollen. That's when my interest started, because that goes down at least another 10 metres. So, in other words, the Rock Inch Grid used to be a great big hole in the ground, really, really big, going down at least 20 metres below present sea level. And the, the river would have simply gone into it. That's, that's a, a drone photo of the area. There's the River Fergus, Corofin's over to the left there, so it's coming in from, from the north. That's the present lake, and that's the deepest point somewhere around there. So down there, anglers have known this for ages, for many, many years, but it, 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 they did this study much more recently, it's good science on it. So a very big hole there in what is now a lake, and the river simply vanished there. Where it came up, I don't know. I guess either around Dromore, what is now Dromore, or what is now Ennis, but we'll, we'll never know that, I'm pretty sure. So that was a, a very primeval river, Fergus, very ancient. But there was another one that the glaciers went away around about 15,000 years ago from, from this part, and the drainage gradually started putting itself together. And I think this was the drainage that established itself in that period. And you can see the River Fergus is chopped into little bits. It's not a river anymore, it's a series of channels that come from nowhere and vanish. Because they're coming from underground and they're going back underground. And what happened at that stage is... stage is there's Inchy Quinn where we were before. The river was now doing what it should do, going through Inchy Quinn, through Corofin, which is there, and then vanishing. And that's the Loch Sidon, which is a lake you hardly see when you're in Corofin, but it's there. <coughs> and if you look on the, the first Ordnance Survey maps in the 1840s, early 1850s, that's where the River Fergus stops. Nothing, nothing comes out on the far side of it like it does today. So for, for that long, long period of thousands of years and still historical times, that was the end of the River Fergus. Now obviously it wasn't the end, it came up again somewhere. Where? I don't know. Maybe around Jamal Lake down there, maybe down at Ennis. We'll look at it, that in a bit more detail in a moment. But that was <coughs> the, the, the river our ancestors knew, right? And big chunks of it were missing. The bit down from Jamal Lake, down to Ennis. Again, no, no water on the surface. It was somewhere underground. And then humans took an interest in the area, as they did over much of Ireland. The 19th century was when arterial drainage began, which meant rivers that was a, were a nuisance, usually because they flooded for part of the year, and they were a nuisance for agriculture, for communications, exactly the same as in the Gort area at the moment, were addressed for the first time by civil engineers, and particularly in the famine period it began, but it extended right through until the 1970s, and then the EU took an interest and said, no more, and it's pretty well stopped. But for a hundred years, arterial drainage changed many, many of the rivers of Ireland, and we don't know that anymore. You, you take what you see on the ground as being nature, often it's not, big time. This is what arterial drainage does to rivers. Straight, canal-like, steep sides, rapid flow of water in them. And that was done to the River Fergus. And over in the distance is Loch Atterdorn, that's Corofin. This is Loch Key here, and this is the River Fergus linking them in straight line sections like that. And that's artificial. That was done by humans, 1840s, 1850s onwards. 
And that's what gives us today's drainage pattern. Human beings have leaked up lakes with channels that weren't there before. The water used to go peacefully around underground, but no more. So, we'll do a, a trip down the Fergus very quickly, starting where it sources, <coughs> sources down there, below Kilfenora. There's only <coughs> two rocks you have to think about. There's those shale rocks, the non limestone rocks that more or less run like that. Doesn't really matter where they are. And we'll look at those points one, two, three to six on the map. And this is the present day Fergus as, as we see it today. But we don't see a lot of it because it's underground. That's where it starts, the, that's non-limestone, that's the shale stuff. This is the place nobody goes south of Kilfenora mm -hmm. because there's very few roads, they're very narrow and tourists just don't go there. But that's the only place you ever see the first five or six kilometres of the River Fergus flowing in a, a normal valley like that. And then it reaches Number one, that mysterious gap that's been there on a lot of the maps that, that I've shown you so far in the Fergus, there's that gap. And that gap is because the Fergus is underground for that. It, it isn't there anymore on the surface. And there you see it happening. Now we're looking towards Corofin from more or less south of Kilfenora. <coughs> so we're looking pretty well east down the River Fergus. There's the Fergus flowing away from us. And you can see it disappears at that point. And that's called the clab, the gap, the mouth, however you want to call it. And it's obviously called that because beyond it, there is a great big valley, big empty space with no river in it. The river used to flow through there, now it's hit the limestone and it's going underground. And that's that gap <coughs> that we saw a moment ago. And it comes up again. That's where we were a moment ago, the river flowing towards that, that's on club. The river flows underground, probably very shallow depth for a kilometre, a kilometre and a half, and then comes up at a spring whose name you won't read at the back for sure, Tonga Bow, there, which is a big spring again, very hard to come up across its way from the nearest road. And there's the river Fergus, rejuvenated and flowing on down towards Corrafin. So there's a bit of non Fergus that's gone underground and it's probably done that in since the last ice age, in the last 15,000 years or so. More water comes out of that spring and then goes down the hole of Anclan. Much more water usually. So a lot of water comes out there that didn't go underground there. Where's it come from? The borough. And it's coming in in that direction from the north. So, look at number two on that map. Number two is a, a miserable little tributary of the river, and so is number three down there. We'll come to it in a minute. Small in length, but really important in water terms. A huge amount of water joins the River Fergus from the underground. It's coming in from the Burren, which is north, off the top of that map there. Really large amounts of water. And there's one of them very close to the road. There's the main road from Lemna Castle going down to Kilnaboy, the elevated bit of that road, if you know that. And just off the road, but again, you wouldn't see it, is the entrance to a cave, a very famous one to cavers, but not for anybody else. And that brings out water. In wet weather, it comes out right at the cave. In dry weather, down at the bottom there. But it's a, a continuous spring of water feeding into the Fergus. The Fergus is down the bottom there, like that. And that drains a big area of the borough. In wet weather, now we're looking the other way. There's the spring, there's the cave, there's the River Fergus in its valley. That's the view you get from your car as you go down towards Kilnaboy. And there is an enormous volume of water coming out after a day or two of heavy rain, a few hours later, out it comes, two days later, gone. But it's a vast amount of water. So you have to think again about that map I keep showing you of the River Fergus. There's more to it than that. Now, this, this 
is a different sort of map. This is where we've been so far from the upper River Fergus, right down the bottom. That dot there is that spring I just showed you. That huge dot is the next spring we'll look at at Elm Vale. And this black line is the area we think drains underground to those springs. So it's part of the drainage that goes into the Fergus. Every drop of rain that lands in that area and doesn't evaporate ends up in one of those springs down there. So there's more to the Fergus <coughs> than we thought. So if we add a bit on to it here, this is a, an X-ray map looking down on the River Fergus and what probably is down there. These are the springs we're just talking about. Okay, they're right down the bottom we've just seen the pictures of. These green lines are imaginary caves, conduits, tunnels, tubes, whatever you want to call it, carrying rainwater down to the river. Some of them have been explored by cavers, one up there, one or two from there, but only for very short distances relative. So what you're looking at is, is a, a river system with a lid of concrete on the top of it, concrete being limestone. It's not very far below the ground, but you don't see those, but they gather up the water, bring it out there, and that's another mysterious part of the Fergus. You wouldn't know existed. It goes a long way, because you're talking about on the brome, that sort of area is up there, and if you die was put in, in a, a swally hole there, <coughs> it went to Ballygorn, some of it went right down to the surface. It was right on the divide where a, a raindrop in theory was split into two, it goes two ways. <coughs> There's the other big spring, again. Elmvale, have you heard of Elmvale, which is near Kilnaboy, very close to the road, one of the biggest springs in Ireland. And it, it gushes out from a cliff down there. There's the springs bringing water. There's the River Fergus. Poplar Bridge is down there, if you know that. And that's the Fergus going down towards Inch Quinn. That spring at Elmvale is the lowest of the springs that feeds the river. Last summer, for example, this was the only water that was feeding into the, the Fergus upstream of Corrothin. All, all the Fergus we've just looked at was bone dry. There was no water at all. The only, the first time you saw water was from Elmvale. This part of the river was dry, and that fed the whole of the Fergus from that point. So what I'm saying is the Fergus is changing all the time, not just on a long time scale, but on a dry summer, wet winter scale. Where there's water, where there's river, is <coughs> changing. Number four down there, halfway between Loch Atadorn, which is Corrafin, and Dromore Loch, which is by the Nature Reserve, which I guess you probably know down there, <coughs> which is number five. And a tiny little lake there, which is called Loch Kill, which is that. Again, there's the Fergus bumbling along, and this is artificial. As you can see, these are the dead, straight 19th century bits of the river. And just before a road bridge is, is this little lake, and it's not there all the time. And you think, so what? Nothing. Except that a lot of the flow of the river goes into it. You can see it happening <coughs> there. There's flow going into that, and it doesn't come out anywhere. And it doesn't come out because there's great big swallow holes in the base of that. If you, if you went there last July, you'd have seen almost all the River Fergus, I think 95% of the flow was going down there and disappearing underground to those swallow holes. And coming out, we know where, <coughs> the water trace, but we'll come back to that later. So there was another finish for the Fergus last year. It appeared at Elmvale, disappeared there, <coughs> and apart from that, there was no River Fergus at all. Well, that probably won't happen for another 30 years, I guess. So, the River Fergus isn't finished. Dromore Lock, we go back to. Dromore Lock is number five. Great big lake. And again, like all the other lakes, it interacts with the river. The lakes and the river are, are interlocked. They shared water between them. And what this character does, Dromore Lake, water comes into it from one side and goes out the other, and it goes nowhere near the River Fergus itself. 
And that's the water from Lock D we were just talking about. It goes from there into the Morlock, from one side out from the other side. And there's the, the two sides. On the north side, there's a great big spring coming into the lake, flows across the lake, goes out on the far side of it, and has nothing whatever to do with the River Fergus. The River Fergus is to one side of it, and in wet weather, the River Fergus flows into the lake, in dry weather, the lake flows into the River Fergus. You never know what you will see in the river. It flows reverse on almost a day-by-day -day basis. Finally, its agony is over, and just the north of Ennis, there's a big spring, again, hard to find, called Polar Dower, and the biggest again in Ireland. And finally, all the water that's gone underground in all those places comes to the surface at this one spring, and then stays on the surface. Just to show you what a mess it is, this is the lower part of, of the River Fergus, from Corrifin down to Ennis. So these are names that must become familiar to you by now, the lakes, like that, a chain of them, and the channel, artificial in large parts, joining them together like that. But superimposed on this are what we know about what's happening underground. Again, X-ray eyes plus surface vision to give you both perspectives. <coughs> so those straight lines, the red lines there, are water tracing lines. Tracer has been put into places like that, the lake I was talking about a lot ago, a moment ago, and where it comes up has been located successfully. The same with the squally hole there of the wall up. We know where that goes and a quarry there. And if you look, that's what nature wants. The underground, the red lines, is the way nature would have it. The blue lines are the way humans have, have tried to make it operate. So the River Fergus is a, a sort of an easy mix between man trying to get the upper hand and say, no, you behave yourself, go from A to B to C to D as we want, and the underground water say, no, we want to go the most direct route, thank you very much, which is directly north-south there. And, and man hasn't run out yet. There's still plenty of flooding in that area. So that's the end of that one. The, the river comes to its senses in Ennis and behaves respectably all the way down to the Channel Estuary. That's one river. The, the other one is different, the, the Gort River in almost every way. Gort River, for a start, is not a, not a proper river. It's an assemblage of streams. It only becomes a river when it goes underground. Secondly, it's pretty well untouched by human activity. It's almost the only area in Ireland where you can say this is absolutely natural drainage for as long as we can imagine. And it's also the one that's most caustic in the sense that the underground really runs things in terms of drainage. What happens on the surface is almost insignificant compared <coughs> with what's going on underneath. It's very, very ancient. The, the previous example, the Fergus, you don't know, but a lot of it's happened in the last perhaps 120,000 years. The River Gort, you're going well back. And again, I can't put numbers on it, I can make up numbers, but, but it will be making up. So, as I said, it, it isn't really a river. There are, there are three rivers, the Owen Shree, which is to the north, I'll show you on the map in a minute, and then the incredible second one, which is actually just one river with, I don't know, seven different names, <laughs> incredibly. And that's the shortest, the Owen Shree is the longest, the second is the general one of those names you want to use, I'll stick with Gort, use one syllable, but the, the, the second one down there is is the shortest of the rivers, and yet it has an incredible number of names attached to it there, and often just for reaches of 150, 200 metres, and then it changes its name for no obvious reason at all. The bottom one there is, is a, at least a, a bit saner. Yes, it's got five names, but they are accounted for by the fact it goes into a big lake and comes out, and it, it, it isn't obviously the same river or even more convincingly, it goes underground and comes out again and it gets a different name when it appears like that. But they, they are the rivers that collectively don't join up on the surface, two of them do, the top two, the third one joins up underground. And the only place you ever see the full river 
He's a cool top, and he should be in there, almost opposite the church. I'll show you a, a slide of, of, of a bit in a moment. But that's almost the only place, just for a few hundred metres, you see the full river, and then whap, it goes underground, and you don't see it again until the sea. So this is the most mysterious of the rivers. Two, two of them I'll look at in a little bit more. The Owen Shree on the left, and the output there, Kimbara. Owen Shree, I said the longest river, middle sized flow to it. And I won't show you this slide again, but halfway down on the right hand side, the river loses about half its water. But you'd never know it. You could walk, walk down the river and you wouldn't know. But in fact, half the flow is sliding away to the right through little crevices and holes in, in boulders. And I'll show you more of that in a moment. So that's the rerun of of what the River Fergus looked like, except this time it's for the, the Gort River, so-called. And the Gort River is really just that bit there, like that. So where are you? Your, the, the motorway will appear lots of times on this. There's the M18 going like that. There's Gort down there. There's Kimbara, there's Korongu. And these are the rivers. These are the Shlebaki Mountains on the right sandstone, no water can go underground, so you get normal drainage. And these three rivers are draining off those mountains, of the, the peating areas like that. This is the only tree, the longest of them like that. And this is the middle one, Valley Lee, and this is the Gort River like that. And they join up almost under the, the old main road from Galway to Limerick. Television is like, well, it's terrible, but when I drew this, these were blue <laughs> all the way down there, and then there's some green there. Can you tell the difference between blue and green? Because I could in my study, but now they all look the same to me. Anyway, when there's two lines, what it means is it's the river, but the river's underground. When it's one blue line, the river's on the surface. So you can see they all start as surface rivers. These two then go to caves and join up. This character has a cave all the way along like that. So historically, that's the way it was. These rivers flowed from mountains, reached the limestone, went underground, and in a great big cave, flowed off the map and came out Summary Galway Bay. So that's Coran Roo, which is where the, the road from Kimbara first goes up onto the Burren, just before that is Coran Roo, the bay. That's where that drainage used to go to. Some of it does, most of it doesn't these days. But really out into Galway Bay at great depth like that. And today it's changed, but not as radically as the other river. This is what things look like today. So again, the, the two colours involved. What's changed is some of the caves up here which weren't very far below the surface, have collapsed. So for Gort, you can see there's bits of river there, then an underground bit, then a river bit, then an underground bit, then a river. So the river just appears in little gaps, but for most of the time, it's underground. And then it goes underground all the way. And the same with this one. The other big changes, most of the water now goes to Kinvara. It changed its mind for, for reasons I won't go into in this talk, but. At some point, instead of going the long route into Galway Bay, it shortcutted it. It took a shortcut and it comes out of Kinbar these days in the spring. So <coughs> yes, this has changed, but we're talking of time span of probably hundreds of thousands to millions of years for, for this drainage network to evolve and to reach the state it has today. Complicated map. I want to try and make a bit more sense of it by saying let's divide it up into three zones. Where we've been so far, there's Gort, there's Korru, there's Kimbara, like that. These are rivers, that's that Owen tree I talked about. This is the, the middle one that goes to Balini, and this is the Gort River, like that. And they all join up, come out from spring there, go underground, go into Cool Rock, like that. This is an old map of produced pre-motorway, so that's the N18 instead of the M18, but near enough <coughs> the same thing, so you can orient more or less where you are. 
But it's maybe easier to think of it as three sort of water zones. On the right, the place where the water is on the surface, in normal rivers, and then goes underground when it hits the geological boundary. So that's that bit of just vaguely call that swallow hole. And you can see there's the rivers disappearing as they get to that. Then there's a middle zone where bits and pieces of river reappear. The underground river comes back to the surface, but then it disappears again. Or it appears in the lake, flows across the lake, and then disappears. There's still water on the surface. But then there's the third zone, the biggest zone, all the way from that area, all the way to Galway Bay, where you don't see any water at all, unless you really search for it. And this is the underground, the totally karstic area. So three sort of zones. I could spend weeks talking about that, but let's simplify it and look at just a sample. The Owen Shree, the most northerly of those three rivers. That's where it rises on the Shree Vorti, like that. It's a, a normal looking stream, except as I say, it's leaking water through its bed that's in that zone. But really, it's a much messier route than that. The Owen Shree changes its behaviour according to the weather, according to water levels. And I've shown you the lower part of the river there in a map under different conditions, and on the right, the, the idea of what it looks like from a drone photo. So there's the river. That's that place I just pointed out to you on the right-hand bank where there's always water leaking away underground. That happens all the time, every day. And that water goes off to Kinvara by its own sweet route. I haven't a clue which way that goes. But normally, in high and medium water, all the, all the river goes into this area called Black Rock Turlock. And beyond that is another lake called Loch Coy, and beyond that is this area called Bally Lee, or Bally Lee Castle, the gates and the rest of it. This is the, the picture of the same thing from the air, and you'll have the, the, the camera over there looking in that direction, okay? So you're looking up to the north, northeast. There's Loch Coy, there's Black Rock Turtle, and what you can't see but going in that is the river, Owen Shree. Under high water levels, it's, it's fairly simple. Some of the water goes underground there, yeah, forget about that, that happens all the time. The rest of the water goes into this black rock cell up there, but never comes out the other side of it, because it's full of swallow holes. So it sinks no matter what. That's the total sink for the river. But some of the water, from Black Rock leaks away and again goes towards Kinvara. Underground, you don't see that again ever. Some of the water goes into Loch Coy and emerges in the lake bed, somewhere like that, and it springs around it. And under these conditions, water flows into Loch Coy. There's the lake, there's a, a spring on the side of it, which is this one, and the water flows out and fills up Loch Coy. Now, coy can be completely dry, it can be massively full, it can be in between. But for part of the time, water flows from underground into it because it's coming out under pressure from water flowing underground from black rock there. So, high water levels, that's the pattern. And the flow goes on down to Bali Lee and joins the big underground river. Medium water levels, the sort of thing, most days it will be doing this. And things have changed. There's Black Rock now, not full of water anymore, like in the past, in the first slide. This time, a stream coming in and all going down that one swallow hole. And what's happened here, there, is the swallow hole that always operates. There's Black Rock, <coughs> and all the water now is going underground. But it's not going to Lock Coy anymore. There's not enough pressure. All the water's going up somewhere else. What's happening at Lock Coy? Lock Coy is now draining. The water's flowing in the exact opposite direction to the previous slide. There's the water going into, into the underground and disappearing. So Loch Coy has what's called an estabel, an estabel, which means a hole in the ground that sometimes brings water out and sometimes takes water in, depending on the pressures of water underground. And this is a classic example of it. Coy empties and fills according to the pressure of water. And there's the, the third condition, 
really low water last summer, again, big time this was. No water even makes it to Blackrock. The Owenshree River completely disappears down that one set of holes in its riverbed up there. Blackrock, Tur Turlock, Bone Drive, that's what Blackrock looked like last summer. Loch Coy, dry or a dribble of water which can't drain away, but it's not active. And the spring there, the valley, the river sinking there. This time the, the hydrological system is at its lowest ebb. Just to contrast, that was Black Rock in, in the summer and the winter there. And that's the, the difference between the two. Two days is enough to, to completely fill it like that. <coughs> And the Cork River is the, the most southerly one, and if you've seen any of these rivers, it's going to be this one. The Cork River, this is a, not totally unintelligible except for the front row, I would say, but that's the Cork River. That's the old main road from Gort down to Ennis. And you won't know when you go across it, but you go right where the, the, the river goes underground. So there's the Gort River underground there, back to the surface, underground, back to the surface, and then it flows north into Gort. And it does, it does this ducks and drakes thing repeatedly throughout its course. Now, effectively, some of the roof of the caves are simply fallen in, and the river is on the surface, and it's not going to re-establish uh, an underground course <coughs> anytime soon. There's one place where it comes out where you can see it, one of the easy places to see it, the Hordua, which is again there on that map. That stays on the surface through Gort and the far side of it. Then it gets north of Gort, underground again, there. And that's that <coughs> sort of hole, which is again just off the main road, just off the motorway, which is spitting distance of the motorway. There's the river, vanishes underground. And then it comes out again at this spring called Hole Dealing. That's Kiltartan Church, which you may be familiar with, so it's very close to that. The main, the old main road is there, the motorway is just uh, that side of it. And that is the Gort River in the real sense. All three rivers have joined up there to form a river. And incredibly, it doesn't have a name. After all the names that I've lavished on, on small streams, the big river, which has the same flow in it as the River Liffey, for example, has no name. So for want of anything better, you could call it the Cool River, because that's what it does. It flows into the Cool Lock next. There's the, a bit you, you almost can see from the motorway. And I guess you'll, if you've driven that, you'll recognise that, that weird eco bridge or whatever it is there. But that, that's what it backs, is it? I don't know. That's where it is. But if you looked, as that's north, if you looked on either side on the motorway there, you would see that. That's a, the, the cool river, the big river we saw on the last slide. All that underground water's come to the surface and then it vanishes there in that big, deep, woody hollow. A, a very unpleasant place to die. And it comes up again there. That's the cool river, spring. And then it flows to the cool lock, just out, out of picture there. So that that is the bit of this this <coughs> weird landform that goes right under the motorway. When they were building the motorway, they were desperate to find where it was for obvious reasons. It must go under there because they know it's in a great big passage, and obviously there's every chance the motorway will collapse into it. But they never did find it. They drilled holes like mad there. They did geophysics until the place was radioactive. <laughs> they didn't find it. Almost certainly because they were looking in the wrong place, because they were, they were engineers, I'm afraid, and they drew the <laughs> A to B. <laughs> but it doesn't. The geology suggests it probably does that sort of thing. It goes in right angles. They didn't look there or there. But beware when you're, you're driving. <laughs> 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 That's where we were, that's the, the old road, there's the motorway, that's, that's the swallow hole and that's the sink we just looked at, okay, and there's the motorway going between the two like that. And as you can see, the river goes down into Cool Lock and it doesn't come out again. And we're in this zone where surface and groundwater mix. And that's the, uh, the mandatory thing map. I'll show you in a <coughs> different form. There's the motorway. 
And that's where we were a moment ago. There's a swallow hole, there's the motorway, there's a spring, there's a cool river, as I've called it, going to cool rock. And <coughs> it goes out through a swallow hole at the bottom of it. And we know that that water goes north to that lake called Cahairn Sawn, and from there it goes to Kimbara. And that's, that's what we know, there's a lot we don't know, but that bit we do know. And en route, it, it intercepts with the surface water. And this is one of the classier examples. This is Cahair Pasorn Rock, which is again in the middle of nowhere. And it's very hard to circumnavigate for, for assorted reasons. The Galway Bay in Kimbara is there. Uh, Gort is back that way, Cool Rock. The underground water comes to the surface. There's a whole row of springs on that bank, the south bank. Here the soil. There's a great big swallow hole on the far side there. And we know that water from cool comes there, goes into the lake, goes in the swallow hole and out the far side. And that's the swallow hole. It's a, it's a huge thing, a large flow of water that goes into it. Cahagasorn is one of the, the strange lakes of Ireland and it's the place to go when it's it's dry weather. In it's affected by how wet it is, but it's also affected by the tides. That's five kilometres in from, from the sea, but it's tidal. And you can go there in the morning, and there's a, a normal lake, about a third the size of that, I suppose, in dry weather. If you go six hours later, there's no water at all. And then the, the water gradually comes back in response to the tides. Not directly, there's a lag of about four hours between the coast and what happens at the coast and what happens in that. But the lake simply disappears and appears twice a day for, for dry pews. It's a, it's a big expanse of water. And finally, there's the bit from Cahir de Sorn to the coast. And the bit, again, we know a bit about, but we need to know more. So there's, there's cool, um, there is saw in the lake. And then that series of arrows is where the big underground river is, the one we saw disappearing into Cool Rock. We know it follows at least part of that route. Oh, we know because part of it's been dived by cave divers, and goodness, one in this room has done exactly that. The bits that have been dived are mapped, so we know exactly what's going on, and more or less from there to about there. So that stretch plus a lot upstream of it. So we've actually got a map of the great big underground river that's down there, and it is a big one in every sense. So the flow is at least that of the River Liffey, probably a good bit more. But it is deep, which is at least 15 metres below the ground level, to water, and then below that again, another 25 or 30 metres. So it's well below sea level, a great big conduit, and from the surface, absolutely no indication at all. And we didn't know it existed until 30 years ago. But it's been explored since then. And what you're looking at there, those names, there's a chain of names like that. What there are are what are called cast windows. And that's a place where the roof, the limestone roof, has fallen in and given you access to the underground river, albeit a very tortuous access. So <laughs> cast windows, you, you can reach the underground river flow. Um, just to give you a feel of what it's like. <coughs> Between these two, Polarokobo and Polbeki there, that's, that's one, about a kilometre, that's been dived in one, out the other, like that. Polarokobo is the upstream one, and this is, again, a drone picture, that's, that's what it looks like. Absolutely inconspicuous. You can walk across the field, past those bushes, of which there's lots of them, but there's a very big hole in the middle of it, like that. And that's what the entrance actually looks like when you're down there. And when you go into that, you can drop down into still water, and if you go deeper still, 20 metres below water level, you get into the flow of the main river. And that's exactly what's been done. And the next one along is Pombehi. Remember, this is a bit further downstream, a bit closer to Corofin, and there it is. Again, looks inconspicuous, right in the middle of a, a rough area of limestone pavement and scrub. 
very hard to find, but when you do, very steep-sided cylindrical shaft with water in one side, black evil water. And if you're crazy enough, you can dive into that to a greater depth and swim downstream or upstream. Upstream takes you to the one we were just looking at a moment ago. And there's a higher level view of, of the pair of them, and you wouldn't know what was going on if the, the river Liffey was flowing along under there, unbeknown to anybody until very, very recently. And it finally comes out at Kinvara at the far end. The, the passage underground is, <coughs> is huge, according to the divers and map. And that's, that's one point of entry to it. What's it like underwater? Well, maybe, maybe something like that. Big, <laughs> in theory, can accommodate divers in large numbers. But that, uh, I'm afraid, is Australia. No. <laughs> <laughs> because in Gould, this is what you see. <laughs> <laughs> and I've talked to most of the cave divers who've worked here one who's here tonight, you can pest her afterwards, and he agrees that's all you see. Silt and heat from the Shevorty Mountains, very low visibility, so it's by feel rather than by sight you're, you're working. But at the end of the day, it all comes to the surface, and today most of it comes out of Kinvara. And there, there are the springs, the, the, the one by the, the tourist honey trap there that uh, enters the castle, one a bit nearer the Galway side, one over the old castle there. Those springs are where it comes. Or oh, the overflow comes out of Corran Rue, just a little bit to the west in Galway Bay, and it's only a small amount of water. You can see it flowing out there, but the conduit there is, is way underground, and it goes out blocked somewhere in Galway Bay. So, that's it. Tour of Two Rivers. Thank you. Thank you.